Hello and welcome back to Principles of Accounting 1. I am still your host, Dr. B. Happy to have all of you with us today. I sincerely appreciate all of you taking the time out of your day to join me for today's lecture. Uh, there are 24 of us on the call today, and I sincerely appreciate that. It does mean a lot to me. You know? uh, just, just you being here means a lot to me. I, I appreciate all of you. I want you to know that from the bottom of my heart. Uh, let's go ahead and talk about uh, adjusting entries, which is what this conversation is going to be about for today's lecture. Adjusting entries are used to really um, make any type of adjustments at the end of the accounting period. And these adjustments are important because we need to make sure that our accounting is correct Okay, at the end of each month. We gotta make sure our books are correct. So I need to make adjusting entries for things like uh, depreciation, uh, unearned revenue, uh, you know, any type of other adjustments. We'll talk about the different kinds. That's the entire basis on why we make adjusting entries, is to make sure that our accounting is correct at the end of each month. So let's talk more about uh, the reports and the difference between cash and accrual-based accounting and the accounting periods. This type of information is going to help us to understand the importance behind making adjusting entries. First, I want to talk about, and I had mentioned it before, is the accounting period. The accounting period is defined as period of economic transactions. Pretty simple, right? Accounting, we look at a period as a month. No, there's 12 months in a year. So there's 12 accounting periods in a year. Look at it as a month. It could be a quarter. A quarter is every three months. Yeah. Semi-annual, every six months annual the whole 12 months this is what we call the accounting period anytime you hear me refer to the accounting period i'm probably talking about a single month i might be talking about a whole year but it's important to understand the differences yeah I might say something like oh the accounting period ending April 30th. Okay, so that means I'm talking about the month of April. Or I might say the accounting period ending 2022. I might be referring to the whole year. Or I might say quarter one, quarter two, right? I'm talking about the referencing into the first or second quarters of the year. I might say the first half of the year. It's important to understand the time period. That's what the accounting period represents. It's the transactions that have happened during that period of time. So that month, that quarter, half a year, a year. These are the accounting periods. There are two methods that we use in accounting. One is called the accrual base of accounting, and the other is called the cash base of accounting. A business will select one of these two accounting methods to record their transactions. The accrual based accounting relies on the accounting principles like the revenue recognition principle and the matching principle to record transactions. We talked about those principles about a, maybe two weeks ago. And when we talked about those principles, we talked about when we recognize revenue, right? During the time period, the accounting period, that it's earned. And we match it to the 
expenses when they were incurred. That's what accrual-based accounting is. In accrual-based accounting, we have accounts like accounts receivable. That's when a customer owes us money for delivery of the good or the service that has already happened. I provided the customer with the good or the service. They have not yet paid me. That's called an accounts receivable. The business expects to receive cash from the customer at a future date. Accounts receivable. Accrual-based accounting also has what we call accounts payable. That's when the business received a bill but has not yet paid it. I received the electric bill for December. Received it in January. I have not yet paid it. It's not due for another 15 days. So I'm going to wait that 15 days to pay them. Okay, That electric bill represents the electric expense that I put into the month of December because that's when the expense happened. The bill I received in January is the account payable. I owe the amount on the bill for the expense that happened in December. See, that's what accrual-based accounting is. I recognized the expense when it was incurred. So to clarify, for things like utilities, we record the utility expense in the month in which it happened, the month in which I consumed that utility. For example, let's say, uh, what is today, the 24th? Let's say it's January 20th. I just received my Pepco electric bill represents the electric that I used in my building for the month of December. It gives me December 1 to December 31. I received the bill January 20th. Based on accrual-based accounting, when I record that transaction in my accounting software, I'm going to date that electric bill for December 31st, even though I received it the next year in the next month, because December 31, 2022, I received the bill January 2023, that electric belongs to 2022's record, not to 2023, because I used that electric in 2022. So on my system, I'm going to record the date of that bill as December 31st, 2022. And I'm going to do that through what we call an adjusting entry. The reason for that is because based on accrual-based accounting, I record the expense in the same accounting period that it happened in. Does that make sense? It doesn't matter when I pay that bill. It matters when the expense actually happened. That's accrual-based accounting. I paid the bill in January, but it was for an expense that happened back in December. Okay, that's accrual-based accounting. Cash-based accounting is different. With cash-based accounting... I recognize revenue and expenses when I pay the cash. Okay, I receive cash from my customer for a service. I record the revenue when I received the cash, not necessarily when the service was performed. So, in other words, if I made a sale back in December and a customer paid me in January... The revenue shows up for January, 
not December. Okay, because with cash base, it all depends on when you receive the cash, which is the opposite of accrual based accounting. And accrual based accounting, I would record that sale for December because it happened in December. You see, that's the difference between the two. Expenses, I record the expense when I pay the cash. Going back to my electric bill example, the electric bill was for the month of December. December 1 to December 31, 2022. That's what it says on the bill. That's when I consume the electric. I received the bill on January 20th. I'm going to pay that bill on January 24th. I record the expense in January. I date it in January because that's when I paid it. That's cash-based accounting. I'm also going to say that in this class, and for principles of accounting too, for those of you who are coming with me next semester, for this class and principles of accounting too, we're going to do accrual-based accounting. Accrual-based accounting. Is it harder? Yes. It's more... Uh, used by more businesses than cash is. Okay. Let me tell you about the two different types of businesses that use each one. Medium to large organizations use accrual based accounting. Okay. Medium to large based businesses use accrual based accounting. And businesses that uh, might rely on customers paying them later or the business paying bills later. Those types of businesses rely on accrual-based accounting. Types of businesses that use cash-based accounting, those would be small local restaurants, hair salons, barber shops, um, lawn mowing services, businesses where cash is the primary method of payment for customers. Those types of businesses commonly use cash-based accounting. Does it make sense? Are there any questions about the differences between the two? It makes, no, it makes sense. Okay, great. Great. Thank you all so much. Appreciate that. That's the best way I can explain it, right? Because it, uh, it's the part that makes the most sense. Here's another example. This one is insurance. I'm going to say prepaid insurance. Okay. We know, we talked about this one. Prepaid insurance is an asset, right? The reason why it's an asset is because the business has the right to retract that payment. It's prepaid. Okay. The business can take that back. That's why it's an asset. Here we have an example. This business received uh, an insurance bill. And it, this insurance policy covers two years worth of insurance. Cool. That's awesome. So uh, now here's how it works. In accrual-based accounting, I take the total amount of that insurance bill and I spread it across evenly over those full two years, over the 24 months. This example, uh, the bill was, uh, let me see, which was this for? $2,400. For $2,400, it covers two years, so that's $100 a month. Take 24 months, two years worth of months, divided by uh, 2,400 divided by 24 months. That gives you $100 a month. So based on the accrual method, I record $100 worth of insurance expense every month for 24 months. The way I do that is I would debit insurance expense $100 and credit prepaid insurance, $100. Does 
We call that an adjusting entry. And we make that at the end of each month for 24 months. What we're doing here is we're spreading that $2,400 insurance bill across 24 months. And we're recognizing the consumption of that insurance expense at the end of each month. Well, with me so far? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, so that is the basis of accrual accounting. All right. Let me show you the cash version. Cash version, real easy. <laughs> a debit uh, insurance expense, $2,400 in December 2019 when I got the bill. And credit cash. That's it. It doesn't get it's spread out. There's no consumption. Because it's cash-based, the cash-based uh, accounting tells us we recognize the expense when we pay it. Not when it's consumed. That's the difference between cash and accrual based accounting. When we recognize revenue, we recognize revenue when we deliver the goods or the service to the customer. Okay, that's so important. Business can only record revenue when we have provided the good or the service to the customer. Deliver the good to your front door that you bought off my website. At that point, I re record it as revenue, as a sale. Yep. I, cannot, I can do it before then, but if I do it before then, what's it called? Who can tell me? What's, what is revenue called if I... But record it before I've delivered the good or the service. Is it credit? Is it what? I'm sorry? Accounts receivable. Oh, that's when the customer... I said, um, I thought it might be credit. Is that because it's not technically in hand yet? No. Accounts payable? No, nope. that's when the business owes money. Is it prepaid? Yes. That's well, almost. Almost. Is that word on on what? Unearned. 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 Unearned, Unearned revenue. Remember that? I, I know it's we talked about it maybe a week or two ago. Uh unearned revenue is when I have uh, received payment from my customer. I've not yet delivered the good or the service. Unearned. It becomes earned revenue when I deliver the good or the service. Unearned revenue is a liability. It's a liability to the company. If you give me money now and I don't, haven't mowed your lawn yet, it's unearned revenue. That's a liability to me. Why is it a liability? Because I have not yet mowed your lawn. If I don't mow your lawn, I have to pay you back. Okay, that's why it's a liability. So recognizing revenue when the goods or the services are provided to the customer, that's when we record it as revenue. Otherwise, it's unearned you know, if the customer paid me in advance. And if neither of those things have happened, then we don't record anything because it it hasn't happened, <laughs> right? So when we record the revenue is really important. Yeah. We record it when we have delivered the good or the service. It's at the amount that we expect to receive from the customer. When it comes to expenses, we recognize the expense During the same accounting period, that same month, that the revenue 
was recognized as a result of the expense. Here's what I mean by that. I sold some products to my customers in the month of December last year, 2022. And as a result of selling those products to my customers, I incurred some expenses. I had to ship the product to the customer, so there's a shipping expense. I had to pay my employees' wages to sell the products to the customer, so there's wage expense. I, I had to pay rent for my store to be able to sell those customers, to sell to those customers, so there's rent expense. All of those expenses that I'm talking about are related to the sales that I made in December. December rent, December wages, December shipping, uh, this, so right, so forth and so on. December electric. <laughs> yeah. All of those expenses are related to sales that I made for that month because I incurred those expenses in that same month. So, therefore, we recognize expenses based on when we recognize the revenue. Right? That's the concept of the matching principle. At the end of each month, I go through what we call an adjusting process because I need to make sure that all of those related expenses get entered into that previous month to match when that revenue happened, match those sales. And we do that through what we call the adjusting process. We're going to talk a lot about that. So the adjusting process. Uh, yeah, it's three steps. To make it easy for you, it's four steps. But let me go through these four steps with you. So what we do is first we determine what the current account balance is. Okay. What I mean by this is we look at the amount of the expenses have happened I need to record in the previous month. Okay, so determine the amount, the balance. Then I determine the current balance sheet and what it should be equal to. That's what I mean by this. I look at the transactions that have happened in cash from the previous accounting period, the previous month, and look at the cash balance on my bank statement. And look at the balance sheet on my accounting record. One would think that they should be the same. Most of the time, they're not. In fact, most of the time, they'll never be the same. Now, here's why. Your cash balance is never going to be the same as the cash balance in your bank account. The reason for that is because of a few things that happen with the bank. One is called bank fees. <laughs> they hit you with a couple fees for even having a checking account, right? Or you might receive this cute thing called interest based off of the balance of your account. We have to record bank fees and interest adjusting entries in order to get your balance sheet cash amount to equal what's actually in your bank account. Okay. That's step three. I'm sorry, step two. And then step three is to record the adjusting entry for those steps. Now, here at the top of this slide, we have, uh, we have four categories. 
the deferral of expenses, deferral of revenue, accrued expenses, and accrued revenue. Deferral simply means we put it off. That's what deferral means. Okay, I'm deferring it. I'll pay that expense later. Okay, or I'm deferring revenue. I will record that revenue later. That's what the word deferral means. Okay. We can think of deferred revenue as being unearned revenue. The reason why I'm not recording it as revenue in December is because I didn't deliver the good or the service until January. It's deferred revenue. I'm going to record it later after I deliver the good or the service. That's why you'll have things like deferred revenue. Because customer paid you, you haven't delivered the good or the service. Therefore, it's not revenue yet. It's unearned revenue. Unearned revenue is a deferral of revenue. I really mean the same thing. Deferral of expenses. A deferral of expenses, I'm going to record those expenses later. Deferral of expenses would be something like prepaid. Okay, I'm not going to record that expense yet because it hasn't yet happened. I'm deferring it. That's what deferred expense means. And the other two we know, accrued expenses and accrued revenue. Accrued expenses, that's when we're we're adding up expense throughout time. Accruing it. We're accruing it. And we're adding it up over time. Here's an example of accrued expense. Wages payable. My employee worked for two weeks. I have not yet paid my employee. Because I pay them every two weeks, right? My employee works for the two weeks. I have not yet paid them. It's called an accrued expense. They accrued the two weeks worth of hours. I have not yet paid them. It's an accrued expense. So, wages payable. That is an accrued expense. Sometimes accounts payable could be an accrued expense. Taxes payable, that's an accrued expense. Okay. Sales taxes payable, income tax payable, etc. Those are accrued expenses. They those expenses happened, I just not have I have not yet paid it. That's accrued. Now we have accrued revenue. I've gotten all my revenue in. I just haven't recorded it yet. Crew revenue. But we'll talk more about these things. Let's talk about the adjusting entries. First, we'll do deferred expenses. Paid. Deferred. Prepaid. I paid it, but the expense hasn't happened yet. As the expense happens... I will record the expense. So here's how it works. With the earlier example of the prepaid insurance, $2,400 for two years or 24 months. When I first paid the insurance premium, I debited prepaid insurance and I credited cash. I paid the twenty four hundred bucks up front, but it's not f- for just December. It covers the next two years. So at the end of January, I'm going to debit insurance expense, and I'm going to credit prepaid insurance. See what I'm doing there is I'm increasing my expense. I'm decreasing the prepaid, the asset. Yeah, that works. I would make this adjusting entry at the end of each month 
for 24 months. So for our prepaid insurance example, exactly as I said, the first transaction is we debit prepaid insurance and credit cash represent the payment of that policy that covers the next 24 months. At the end of the first month, I debit insurance expense and I credit prepaid insurance. So what this is doing is it's increasing my insurance expense account and decreasing my prepaid insurance account. This is what we call an adjusting entry. Adjusting entries represent consumption of something that affect a certain accounting period. We record these transactions at the end of each month to represent consumption of that expense. Of course, we figure out our balances. You always have to make sure you track your balances. So because prepaid insurance is an asset account on the balance sheet, I track my balance. Started out with $2,400. Subtract $100 because it became an expense. So now I'm down to $2,300 for my prepaid insurance account. Now on the income statement, we just report it as an expense. Yeah. That balance uh, gets reset at the end of each month. I don't go starting February 1st, stuff on my income statement. The income statement gets reset to zero at the beginning of each accounting period. We'll talk more about that soon. So there's the trans, that first transaction, debit, pre, uh, uh, insurance expense, credit, prepaid insurance. This is the adjusting entry. Here's another example. Adjusting for supplies. I love supplies. Supplies sometimes we use in the business or it might also represent inventory that we sold. So our company purchased $9,720 worth of supplies in the month of December. Some of these supplies were used during the month of December. So we have to make an adjusting entry for that amount that we used. Step two, we did a physical count and it shows that we have unused supplies of 8670 Well, I could quickly figure out how much I used in December based off of this information. I take my 9720 beginning balance, and I subtract out the 8670 ending balance. That gives me the difference. The difference is how much I used. So, the first part of this transaction, or the first transaction was... I debit my supplies account by the purchase amount, 9720 And I credit my cash because I paid for it in cash, probably. I ended up using $1,050 worth of supplies. Remember, that's the difference between those two amounts we talked about earlier. So, I... Make an adjusting entry at the end of the month, end of December. I debit supplies expense $1,050. And I credit supplies. See? The last step, of course, is to keep track of your balances. There we go. So many animations. <laughs> so here's the adjusting entry. 
rates, as we talked about. But supplies expense, credit supplies. So remember, the best way to think about adjusting entries is that we're recognizing the consumption of something, right? Professor, I have a question. Please. So the income statement um, is basically credit, crediting your expense. Is that uh, correct? One side of it is crediting the yeah. expense on the income statement. Yeah, you're. Yeah, you're. You're basically there. Exactly. So. Okay. So the way it works, Portia, is uh, uh, we are increasing our expenses uh, at the end of each month to recognize the consumption of those expenses, the use of those expenses. And to do that, we debit the expense to increase the expense, and we credit whatever's being used. So, but yes, you're you're... Your train of thought is exactly right. Yep. Depreciation. This concept can be somewhat confusing, so I'm going to use very simplistic examples. I want you to think about the house that you live in, the car that you drive, the equipment that you use. Over time, these things lose their usefulness. They break down. Okay? Anything with motors and wheels break down over time. Okay? It's just, it's just physics. Yeah. Things break down over time. It's like our bodies, they break down over time. Okay? They use their useful... Well, we hope not, but you see what I'm saying. Uh, fixed assets, like property, plant, and equipment, lose their usefulness over time. Okay? The things don't last forever. And so, in accounting, we need to... Allocate the loss of usefulness of the asset. We call this depreciation. We depreciate the value of the asset over its useful life. That is depreciation. Okay. That's why sometimes you might hear your friends say, uh, Oh, you know, the minute I drove that new car off of the off the lot, it lost its value. It sure did. It it depreciated. Uh, every year you look at the value of your car, it goes down. Of course it does. It's depreciating in value. This is normal. Things go down in value over life of the asset. The same with a house, even, a building. Buildings go down in value. Why? Because they break down. you got to replace your roof every 30 years. Less, in some cases. you got to replace your air conditioning unit every 10 years. you got to replace your water heater every 10 years. you got to replace your air, con you know, etc., Things break down. And to recognize the fact that the building uses, loses its useful life, we depreciate it. The one thing that never depreciates, though, is the land. Land never depreciates. The planet will still be here. We think. We hope. The planet will still be here. Okay, The dirt is still there. I can bulldoze the building and put a new one up. The land never depreciates. The dirt will still be there. Dirt ain't going nowhere. Must act of God, but we're not going to go down that road. Land itself never depreciates. The building does. The equipment does. Vehicles do. 
The land itself will never depreciate. Remember that one. How do we figure out the value of depreciation? How much is it losing over its useful life? There's a formula. There's a few formulas, but I'm going to give you the easiest one first. We call this straight line depreciation. This formula represents the amount of the value the asset loses every year over its useful life. There's a couple of caveats here. Useful life is determined by how long you expect it to last. Good news for the people that love the government. The IRS tells us how long things last for. And all right, there's a whole report, and it lists out pretty much all assets. And it tells you exactly how long it should last. For example, a car lasts an average of five years. In a, in a business, okay? Not your personal car. In a business, a car lasts you about five years. The building probably lasts you about 30 years. Equipment, certain kinds of equipment, might last you anywhere between 5 and 15 years, depending on what it is. All of these things, the useful life is told to us through a report called the Maker's Report, M-A-C-R-S. This is found on the IRS's website. Okay. But for all intents and purposes, for this, to keep this class easy, I'm not going to have you go looking at stuff like that. Okay. Useful life depends on how long we expect something to last for. So here's the formula. Here's how much value the asset loses each year. We take the cost of the asset. This is the purchase price plus the installation cost, insurance, whatever, to get the machine or asset installed. Call that the asset cost. How much it cost us? Minus salvage value. The term salvage value means how much we expect the asset to be worth at the end of its useful life. How much we expect the asset to be worth at the end of of its useful life. We call that salvage value. The word salvage simply means how much is its scrap value. In most cases, it might be zero. In some cases, it might be yeah, a few thousand dollars, maybe. Divided by useful life. Useful life is in terms of number of years that we expect the asset to be useful for. So cost minus salvage value divided by useful life. I'm going to give you a real quick, easy example. I bought a dump truck for $25,000 to haul around dirt from one job site to another. My asset cost is $25,000. I've been told that the salvage value is zero that the dump truck will last me for five years. What is my straight-line depreciation expense? We take the asset cost, $25,000, minus zero salvage value, divided by five years. That tells me my straight-line depreciation expense is $5,000 per year. As an accountant, that means I need to record an adjusting entry for the depreciation of the dump truck at the end of each year for five years of $5,000. I debit depreciation expense, $5,000, and I credit accumulated depreciation, $5,000. We're going to talk more about this, but uh, 
I, I saw a couple of hands up. Is it always accurate? Is it always accurate? <laughs> I don't know. That's a good question. Um, in most cases, yes. In most cases, yes. Here's why I say that, Henry. Uh, there might be a situation where, let's say, that dump truck expected to last me five years only lasts me three because the engine blew on it or uh, it got wrecked, okay? Or something insane happened to it. <laughs> so in that case wasn't so accurate. <laughs> and I would have to make an adjustment to my depreciation method. So to answer your question, Henry, Yes, in most cases, it is accurate. In some cases, life happens to things. So we have to make adjustments. Great question, Henry. We're going to go through some examples of, of those kinds of things as well. Excellent. Let's talk more about this useful life thing. How long we expect it to last for? That's useful life. How long is it going to help me to generate revenue? That's its useful life. I'm going to have that dump truck for five years. It's going to haul dirt back and forth between job sites, which helps me to produce revenue, right? I need the dump truck to do the job, get the revenue from the job, right? Useful life, five years. How long is it going to last? How long is this dump truck going to last me for? IRS says five years. It could be more. It could be less. Okay. It depends on the wear and tear. But it's just like what Henry said. How do we know it's accurate? Well, it's, we're pretty well assured that, yeah, it's accurate. But what if something, what if I use that dump truck heavily? Okay. And I need to replace that transmission in year three. If I need to replace a transmission in year three, we call that an extraordinary repair. What I mean by that is it's more than just changing the oil. I'm changing the motor out. I'm changing the transmission. That's what keeps the thing going. When I do that, it's called an extraordinary repair. Now, what happens to the useful life when I do that extraordinary repair? It extends it. Because now, with a new transmission at the end of year three, that dump truck's not going to last five years. It's going to last seven or ten. So, the answer to your question, Henry, is ultimately we make an adjustment to our depreciation process order to justify any extraordinary events. Damon. Oh, Damon. Sorry, how many businesses do you think uh, keep a record of things like uh, the useful life, uh, the dump trucks or, or, or cabs or all of police them. cars, all of them, all of them. They, they, they really have to, uh, there's no, there's no law that says, they, well, technically there is kind of a law that says they have to, but if they're smart, they, they do it. Here's why Damon, here's why I say that. Let's say you own a construction business. Okay. And you got yourself a couple of dumb trucks and a, you know, the back hole machines and uh, the digging stuff and whatever construction companies have. The rigs, all those things. Uh, if you don't depreciate those assets, you're losing out on huge tax breaks. Okay. In accounting, oh, uh, in business, the reason why a lot of businesses have professional accountants is because 
they don't want to pay a whole lot of money to the IRS. They want to keep some of that money. And depreciation is one of those expenses, big expense, that a lot of businesses write off as a tax deduction. So why would I want to keep track of the useful life of all of my equipment? Well, if I don't want to pay a whole lot of money to the IRS, I'm going to be wanting to know the useful life so I can accurately use the depreciation expense to then write off in my taxes. Gotcha. Yeah, that's that's the real life reason. <laughs> Not the textbook reason, but the real life reason. <laughs> Good question. So salvage value. I'd mentioned that it's whatever it's worth at the end of its useful life. It's salvage value. We also call this scrap value or expected market value. What's it worth at the end of its useful life? So at the end of the useful life of that dump truck, end of five years, it might not be worth anything. Just throw it out, you know, bring it to the dump or or donate it. Yep. But if it's worth something, meaning somebody might want to buy this, even though it barely works anymore, uh, we call that salvage value, whatever that dollar amount is that they want to buy it for. And yes, that can be reworked into your um, depreciation expense model. Another example. Company uh, purchased a piece of machinery for $26,000. It has a useful life of five years. It's expected to be worth about 8000 at the end of the five years. So at the end of its useful life, it has a salvage value of 8000 bought it on December 1 uh, and we made it to the end of the month. So we've only used it for a month since we bought it. So we need to run through the depreciation expense model. So original cost 26000 December 1. Has a salvage value of 8000 that gives me what we call a net cost of 18000 So remember the top of that um, equation, original cost minus salvage value, that's the same as saying net cost. 18000 in this example. So original cost minus salvage value. The top of that, accounting, that, uh, uh, top of that uh, equation, 18000 in this example. Useful life is five years. So normally, I would just say, hey, 18,000 divided by the five years. That's straight line depreciation. So, uh, where's my calculator? There we go. There it is. Got my calculator. So, 18,000 divided by your five years, that's $3,600. Per year. Now remember the example the this example said I bought it on December 1. It's now the end of the year. Well that means I need to depreciate it for one month for that particular year as an adjusting entry. Yeah. So what I do is $3,600 divided by 12 is $300. In other words, it's $300 per month, each month over the five years. At the end of December, I would make an adjusting journal entry. I would debit depreciation expense, $300, credit accumulated depreciation, $300. As an accountant, I would want to do that every single month for the next 60 months is five years. So debit depreciation expense, credit accumulated depreciation, every single month. That's the transaction.
There it is. I was looking for it. Ooh, is there someone? On the balance sheet, I need you to understand something. This is very important. We never reduce the balance of the asset directly. We never reduce the balance of the asset directly. What I mean by that is we don't just reduce the value of the asset by subtracting the $300 every month from the equipment line. We don't do that. Instead, we have this account called accumulated depreciation. Accumulated depreciation is what we call a contra asset account. It's an, it's an asset account that holds a negative balance. The word accumulated means added all together, right? It's, we've accrued it, accumulated it. So instead of reducing the equipment line, we just subtract out accumulated depreciation to get the balance of the asset. Reason, the reason why we do it this way, instead of taking it right out of the asset account, is because at the end of the equipment's useful life, you won't be able to calculate the salvage value if you just reduced it from the equipment. Quite done that way. Okay, let's go through an example of deferred revenue. Apologize. Oh, yeah. Okay, cool. All right, I I, uh, I just read the chat. Um, we we're talking about the one earlier. So <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, I got a little distracted. Deferral of revenue. This is unearned revenue. Yeah, just like we talked about earlier. Unearned revenue, we receive cash from our customer in advance of providing the good or the service. Unearned revenue, it's liability. Okay. So the first transaction is I debit unearned revenue, which is a liability account. Oh, I'm sorry. I I credit I debit unearned revenue. The first transaction is I debit cash and I credit unearned revenue. The second transaction is I debit unearned revenue to reduce it and I credit revenue to increase the revenue. This is when I recognize the revenue. A little ahead of my skis. Uh, so here's an example. I have a customer paid me 60-day fee in advance to cover uh, about two months worth of service. Cool. So I record the payment uh, at the time that I received the cash. So first, debit cash, and then credit on earned revenue. So then, as time goes on, I need to recognize the revenue. So I recognize it in increments as I'm providing the good or the service, in this case, the service. So in step two, I calculate it, how much was technically earned. So I earned five days worth. So I do five over 60 times the amount. That's $250. So I would debit unearned revenue, $250, credit revenue, $250. That's the adjusting entry. Anyway. 
That's the first transaction. Customer gave me the cash up front, debit, cash, credit, unearned revenue. And then the second transaction is, after I show you the T accounts, it's like debit, unearned revenue, and credit revenue. Next example is for accrued expenses. Uh, again, this could be something like wages payable, accrued expense. Yeah. In order to record that, I would uh, debit wage expense and credit wages payable. Yeah, speaking of which, here's an example of that. Uh, got an employee, makes $70 per day, works five days a week, so $350. Salaries are paid every two weeks on a Friday. That's nice. Uh, at the end of the year, it happened to be on a Wednesday. So for three days, I accrued uh, wages, $70 per day, three days a week, uh, three days Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, it's $210. So I need to make an adjusting entry on December 31 to show the accrued wages at the end of the year. Because remember, based off of the accounting periods, December being a full month, December 1 to December 31, I need to make sure I record those transactions that have happened in that month of December. So that, that's why we do these adjusting entries, right? Here's three days worth of wages. 70 times 3 is 210. Uh, I debit uh, wage expense and credit wages payable. Wages expense, credit wages payable. Wages and salaries, it's the same term. Yeah. Here's what it looks like on the balance sheet and the income statement. And at the end of the accounting period, I pay my employee the next month you know, after the two weeks, I debit wages payable to reduce the payable amount. Debit wages expense to increase the additional expense from the additional time the employee worked so that additional some days, right? Two days plus five. And then I credit cash to represent the payment of my employee. And uh, accrued revenue, which I think was one of the last categories on for this part. Revenues uh, earned in the period but have been unrecorded. I got the cash, but I didn't. Or I got the pay for the customer. I have, haven't recorded it yet. So that's what, what we do: is we debit cash, credit revenue, straight forward. And uh, here's an example of that. Uh, customer agreed to pay on January 10th for the next year of future services over those days. On December 31, 20 days of the service has been provided. I need to calculate those 20 days. I do that by taking the payment amount times 20 over 30, which is, shows the 20 out of the 30 days during the month. Gets me to eighteen hundred dollars, so I make the adjustment for eighteen hundred dollars. Debit uh, and and credit accordingly. Debit accounts receivable, and then we credit the revenue. This is the impact on the balance sheet and income statement. Then here's the future receipt of 
accrued revenues, $1,800, plus that next uh, remaining part of the revenue that we expect to receive from the customer. Debit cash, credit the accounts receivable because they're paying us for those 20 days, plus the remaining 10 days. Record that remaining 10 days to, to revenue. worry i'm not going to have you do complex stuff like that it's just it's good to know stuff yeah uh this this just summarizes uh the deferrals and accruals that we talked about deferred revenue def deferred expenses uh and then of course the accruals and the relationship to the income statement and balance sheet and the adjusting entries. Think of this like a summary slide. Yep. One of the financial statements that we accountants use called an adjusted trial balance. The adjusted trial balance shows us the unadjusted amount before we make adjusting entries and the ending balance after we've made the adjusting entries for each account affected on the balance sheet and income statement. Uh, I like to refer to it like a spreadsheet. So it's kind of that's really kind of what it is. It's a list of all the accounts on the balance sheet and the income statement uh, where we had adjusting entries. And on the far left column, we have the account names, and then we got uh, the unadjusted amount, so the, the previous balance before we made the adjusting entries. And then in the middle you see the adjustments, since those are the adjusting entries that we made. At the end, that's the adjusted balance. The reason why we call it a trial balance is because this type of financial statement helps us accountants to make sure that our debits and credits equal even after we've made adjusting entries. Kind of like a system of checks and balances. Make sure that all of our information is correct. That's the way I like to think about it. <laughs> so how do we, what do we need to create an adjusted trial balance? We need the information from the income statement uh, and the balance sheet, of course. So we prepare the income statement uh, statement of equity, balance sheet, statement of cash flows. We take the information from those reports. So that's steps one through four. Or yeah, I'm not going to have you create one of these. It's, that would take forever. Uh, and we see, we take those balances on our income statement, balance sheet, statement of equity. Those beginning balances are found on our uh, adjusted trial balance. Those are our unadjusted amounts. And, I, and then after that, I take care of all my adjusting entries, and then I compare it. So that's, that's what a, an adjusted trial balance is for. It's really a system of checks and balances. But uh, you don't need to dive too deep on that. It's funny I talked about profit margins earlier because wow, that's today's Fun fact ratio <laughs> is profit margins. As a business owner or a business manager, it's really important that you know your profit margins. If you know your profit margins, you could go to your manager and be like, hey, you know, this is something I learned from my, my accounting professor, Dr. B, and he thought it'd be really cool if I knew this. Uh, I tell you, if you if you do this type of uh, computation for your for your boss or your manager, they'd be impressed uh, because it's um, it's really important to know this. Yeah, 
as a manager or as a business owner, this will help you to set your prices and to really understand your products, how much you need to sell, etc., to generate a certain amount of profit. So to calculate the profit margin, we need two amounts. We need net income and total revenue, also known as net sales. And these two amounts will give us the profit margin. So we take net income, which is found at the bottom of your income statement. Remember, uh, remember, net income is at the bottom of the income statement. We take our revenue minus all of our expenses to equal net income. Yeah, it's on the income statement at the very bottom. Take net income divided by sales or total sales also known as net sales. This could also be called total revenue. Also, on our income statement, but at the top, yeah? So, net income at the bottom of the income statement divided by net sales at the top of the income statement gives us our profit margin. And when you tell your boss what the profit margins are, I promise you, you can, your boss can be impressed. You know, because... Those are good numbers to know. Helps us to set prices and things like that. And the last thing I want to talk about is uh, the prepayments. Uh, another way to record uh, those prepayments, um, especially if we're talking about using the cash method versus the accrual method. This is what this kind of summarizes. Just wanted to show you that. Just food for thought. It's always interesting to see that. Okay. I think we're there. All right, great. Are there any comments, questions, concerns, anything at all that I can help you with today? that we didn't cover? Anything that you have questions about that we covered? Anything? You know, Professor, you did a wonderful job explaining it. I feel like this chapter is a little bit more easier than the previous two. <laughs> a little bit more straightforward. Yes, I, I totally agree with you, uh, Rachel. Totally agree with you. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, oh, great. Um, okay, as always, if you need me for anything, help with a question on the homework or the quiz or whatever it is in this class, you can email me, you can call me, you can set up office hours. Remember, to set up office hours, it's really easy. Just go into the classroom, select that office hours button, Select 30-minute session, even if it doesn't take the whole 30 minutes, that's okay. Select the date available, select the time slot that you want, and the, just fill out the quick form, sends you an email, sends me an email, creates the calendar. Very easy. Okay. If those times and dates don't work for you, because you might be in the apprenticeship program and you're working, you know, Monday through Friday all day, every day, no problem. Send me an email. I'll be happy to set up a different time with you. Uh, so if you ever need me, email me, call me, set up office hours. Whatever you need from me, I am here for you 100% of the time. And with that... Thank you, Professor. I, I appreciate you. I appreciate all of you and your hard work. I just wanted to say that from the bottom of my heart. I really do appreciate all of you. And I think you're all doing a fantastic job. I want you to keep up that effort, too, okay? Uh, use that Thursday class time to finish your Chapter 3 work. Uh, you know, And during that time, if you need me, just shoot me a quick email, yeah? I'll be there. And with that, I want to say stay safe, wash your hands, do all the right things, I'll see you all again next time. Thank you so much. Appreciate all of you. 
Have a wonderful rest of your night. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you. Have a nice evening. Thank you. You as well. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Take care, y'all. Take care. Thank you so much.